Hi, Amanda. <laughs> Hi there. And nice to meet you. It's so lovely to meet you too. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Not at all. It's it's my great pleasure. I, I have to say, Amanda, I've I've been so captivated reading about you and your decades of work and you know everything that you've done at Beckley Foundation you know you're really focused on global drug policy reform and and scientific research into psychoactive substances and I was just wondering you know for my listeners who might not be familiar could you maybe start by explaining a little bit about the history of psychedelics because you know lots of people are talking about psychedelics and plant medicine but I know they have deep indigenous roots and, and the uses extend far, far back. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I'd be delighted because that is really what's so absolutely fascinating about them because they've been part of the human cultural evolution from, I think, the very beginning. And in fact, in the caves at Chauvet in France, which are the kind of oldest cave paintings yet found, 35 to 40,000 years old, they were doing pictures of such incredible beauty and powerful lines. And then from then onwards, one can see the markings of altered states. And now there are many ways in which one can change one's consciousness. But what is fascinating is our ancestors have been developing these systems of getting a higher state of consciousness ever since we stood upright, basically. And I think they were very integrated with the creation of the human culture, like speaking, spirituality, uh, community, music, art, all of those things which are specifically evolving into the human culture. Yeah, it's it's really it's really fascinating. I, I read that you had quite a difficult experience with spiking at a young age. And and I don't want you to share more than what you feel comfortable about that incident. But what was interesting to me is how how did that get you personally interested in pursuing a career in the field of psychedelics? Well, I had been interested in psychedelics and in consciousness from a very, very early age because I live in this incredibly beautiful, isolated spot up a long track. And my parents were wonderful, but my father had no income and no wish to make an income. He was an artist and eccentric. And so we had a very outside society lifestyle, um, which had its benefits and its disadvantages, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, as all upbringings do. But from a very early age, my mother was a Catholic, my father was agnostic atheist, and his best friend, who was my godfather, became a Buddhist monk. So I had a little bit of all the, the flavors but then I was always fascinated with the mystical experience from a very early age, 10 or something, and I started studying it. And then at 16, I was introduced to cannabis, and 1965, LSD had come to London, and I was an early experimenter with it. And I must say, I find it utterly amazing because it enabled one to experience those mystical experiences one had in childhood again. Mm. But in a kind of uncontrolled way, I had a um, flat in London overlooking the river and it became a centre of, of kind of psychedelic life. And it was awful fun with a lot of <laughs> musicians and artists and people trooping in and out. And it was a very exciting period, I have to say. But then someone who I didn't like and didn't want around... He had a bottle of LSD from Sandos, who makes it, a vinegar bottle, full bottle. Gosh. And he just tipped it into my coffee when I said I didn't want any LSD. So it was thousands of trips he poured in, in order to kind of take advantage of me. So that was a terrible trauma. Mm. It's like a dagger in the soul, basically, cutting, cutting out 
Yeah, a very unpleasant negative experience. And so I retired to the hut at Beckley, where I lived, to kind of recover. And then a few months later, some friend came and said, come on, you must come out. There's a party in London with Ravi Shankar playing and, you know, come on. So I went out and there I met this Dutch scientist, extremely good looking and charmful, called Bart Hugues, who had just arrived that day. And we fell in love. And then I learned from him, so I had, I considered the best teacher I could have in the world to learn about psychedelics. And he had a hypothesis about its effect being through the serotonin 2A receptor, constricting the veins and getting more blood in the brain capillaries. So suddenly one had great expansion of energy for the brain. So Mm -hmm. all the brain was interacting with each other instead of just a few parts. This was long before it was prohibited. And it was an interesting period of exploration and discovery. Yeah, it's it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, you know, it's it's awful the experience you had, obviously, in the beginning. But just kind of thinking about society now as a whole, you know, for much of the past century, psychedelics were seen by greater society as, I guess to put it bluntly, like stoner drugs. And the media has often portrayed them as gateways to hippie trips or to get high at music festivals. And then suddenly LSD and psilocybin were banned and your long fight began. When and why, you know, did you notice a shift in the way society perceives these substances? Well, I'd say the major shift has happened in the last three or four years. It was a very, very long, slow journey. I realized in 1966 that these are compounds which are really different from other drugs and should be categorized as different. It's a terrible pity they share the word drug with the compounds which are, as we all know, very addictive, like cocaine and heroin and methamphetamine. And they're all put in the same bag. And when I had started to learn about them in 1966, and then I thought these are really truly incredible and I must study them and see, find out what are their underlying mechanisms so we can understand how to use them. This was all before criminalization. But it was very difficult even then to get doctors and scientists interested in them. So it was quite a kind of, one was out on one's own, if you see what I mean. Yeah. But coming from a background where I was on my own, I didn't really mind. I never felt particularly isolated. And I always had a friend or two who shared my views. So it was a period of immense excitement, those years when I was learning about Actually, learning science, because I'd grown up in more an artistic world, not a scientific world. What do you think was like the evidence that kind of led to fears around the drug's impact on people and their mental health? Well, what I realised when the constriction of prohibition came down, when I already realised what amazing compounds these are, because I had actually given up a long habit I'd had. I was totally addicted to smoking by the age of 21 or something. And actually, Bart said to me, oh, that's a disgusting habit. And I just said, oh, well, I'll, I'll give it up. I'll take an LSD dose and decide I'll give it up and give it up. And that's what I did. And I never smoked again. So I realized the power that the psychedelic can give you to make a decision and keep to it. And so actually 40 years later or something, when I was talking to Roland Griffiths at 
at um, Johns Hopkins. And I had, I think, five or ten thousand dollars to invest in to do some research to show that with psychedelic assisted therapy, one can give up, overcome at a much deeper level an addiction that one's got. And I realized back in, say, 1966, the only way forward to overcome the taboo created by um, the UN drug conventions, which had made them top criminality, was by doing the very best science to demonstrate the amazing potential of these compounds to help humanity in many, many different areas. And there's a close similarity between meditation and the disciplines of spirituality and what psychedelics can give you. They're both working in the same direction within the um, distribution of blood in the brain. So there's a commonality between the two experiences. And so that's what I did. I set up the intention to do the research and to reform global drug policy. And obviously, as a single female with no letters after my name, no money, no anything, actually, I, after 30 years of trying to do that through art, and I did various artworks around the world. One was standing for Parliament twice in England, because England's very democratic in that way. So I stood for Parliament on the standing of trepanation for the national health. Speaking of, um, of trepanation, like one of the most fascinating pieces of information that I learned about you in preparing for today mm. was something that, you know, I, I hadn't heard about before. And I, I bet a lot of listeners won't have either. Like, Can yeah. you exactly explain like what trepanation is, what it means and what your personal relationship to it is? Yes. It's not the main focus of my work, but trepanation is an ancient practice, the oldest operation in the world. The oldest trepan skull, I think, is 25,000 years old, and it is removing a piece of bone from the skull to restore the possibility of the membrane surrounding the brain to expand on the heartbeat. So... When you look at a baby and fontanelle open, you can see the pulsation and then the fontanelle close, but there's still expansion in the, in the sutras, haven't really closed together until you become adult. And when you become adult, a new kind of level is reached, which suppresses some of the systolic pressure, not the whole lot, but some of it. So there's a little less blood reaching the brain capillaries, and a little less energy to wash the toxins out of the brain through the cerebral spinal fluid. And so the hypothesis is, and it isn't yet proven, is that it gives back to the skull what was there in childhood, which is the possibility of expansion. And so you get a little bit more extra blood in the brain capillaries, which makes a very subtle difference. And I've always explored new ideas on myself. My basis of observation is on myself. And so then I thought, well, I'll try it to see if it works, what, what difference it makes, if it makes any difference. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating, but this also sounds like really dangerous. We don't want people trying this at home, right? What are, yeah. what are the risks for something like this? You know, obviously, it's potentially dangerous, very dangerous and shouldn't ever be undertaken. But, you know, the 60s were a freer generation when, and anyway, I came from a background where one took risks. So I took mm. the risk of doing it, which I wouldn't suggest anyone else does. Um, but what I'm fighting for now is to do the research which will 
I hope and uh, presume, show that it brings about a slight difference, namely of restoring oneself to the energy level one was before, let's say, 13. Children have more energy. You know, you can always see they're jumping around. It's an endless source of energy. And that we slowly lose at adulthood. And then it goes on diminishing, sadly, until old age. And I'm fascinated in studying. That's my passion, really. Now, I used to be an artist, and then I gave up painting in order to do science, because I thought I could make more difference to the world. I always had an ambition, as I'm sure you have, to do good in the world somehow, to make a difference, do something which makes the world a better place. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Jordan North. And I'm William Hansen. And together we host Help I Sexted My Boss, a podcast that combines William's world of etiquette tips with Jordan's special northern charm. We help navigate the everyday challenges of modern life. Like how to tell someone that their breath smells like death. And of course, what should you do if you've accidentally sexted your boss? Just search for Help I Sexted My Boss on BBC Sounds and help us change your life for the better. Or potentially maybe make things worse. It could go either way. I'm really interested in in all the the research that you've been doing, and I, I've also read that it's your belief that substances like LSD can help treat things like anxiety, depression, and addiction. Absolutely. And for me and the listeners at home who might not be as science minded as yeah. you are, yeah. like, it, can you explain how you reach those conclusions yes. and what they might mean for the future of treating those sorts of um, conditions? Yes, absolutely. Obviously. All drugs can be dangerous because they're powerful substances. Mm. And so Mm -hmm. they can end in disaster. And one has to know deeply and be cautious of how to use them. And I was very lucky that at that point in 1966, I met this Dutch scientist who was very aware of the potential dangers, and I learned Mm -hmm. that. So we took LSD. People thought we were mad then, but still think we're mad, to actually (laughs) study. (laughs) And we did much more exciting and creative work by having more of the brain simultaneously functioning. And what I think the psychedelics do through uh, the serotonin 2A receptor, which... I'm now doing research at Cornell University to investigate. It's only just become possible, the technology, to look at the um, microorganisms and how LSD can stimulate the tone of the walls of the microvasculature to dilate or contract, and therefore to direct the blood to where it goes. And that's what it's all about the quantity of blood in the capillary because it's from the blood that the brain gets its energy. Back at the beginning, I was a slight depressive myself, so I was always interested in the treatment of depression. And I found that um, in those days, the favourite and cleanest and most available compound was LSD. And I found that LSD improved my mood increased my capacity to function cognitively higher. So that showed to me it improves one function. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, some people, I guess, worry about these kinds of drugs come with risks, whether it be for people struggling with their mental health or if they mix it with other substances like alcohol or drugs. And I guess some people can find it quite distressing Can you summarise how that factors into your advocacy? There is absolutely no doubt that drugs are potentially dangerous compounds, but it's like mountaineering or riding a horse or whatever. It has its risks, and 
one shouldn't use them without knowledge of how to use them. Mm. And the tragedy is we took the wrong turning in civilization to criminalize all these compounds, particularly the psychedelics, mm. became Schedule 1, which means the highest risks and no known benefits. Well, that is not true. They're non-toxic so there are risks, but they're more psychological, not physiological. And they're also, as we're showing over the last 20, 30, 40 years, they're potentially incredible keys to alter consciousness to a level where it is facilitated to change the setting one's got. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all the result of conditioning. And some of us have more painful and damaging conditioning than others, but we all have damage from our conditioning, which mm. forms our, our patterns of behavior and the way we work, the behavior and how we react. And prohibition has lost us 60 years of scientific research which is a tragedy because, you know, millions of people are suffering from depression, anxiety, and it is being demonstrated very slowly that with the right use of the psychedelics in the right setting, with a psychedelic-assisted therapy, you can get deeper into yourself and change your patterns of behavior Mm. at a very deep level, which you don't get with SSRIs, which are the only alternative medicine. So I set up a study, and the first study I wanted to do was to look at LSD and the changing of the blood supply, but it, one couldn't use LSD because one wouldn't get ethical approval, so we use psilocybin, mm -hmm. the mushroom. And that study was a breakthrough study because it showed a reduction of blood in the default mode network, which basically is the ego. You know how we've all got this little talky voice in our brain, always yeah. telling us we're lousy or telling us we're brilliant or telling us this, telling us that. And that's the ego mechanism. And when a person, as we all do, has depression or anxiety or addiction, the ego, the default mode network, as it's now called, is hyperactive. So by seeing it had less blood to it on psilocybin, mm -hmm. we realized, well, maybe this is a possible treatment for depression. So then we did a small research, 20 people, looking into how psilocybin-assisted therapy could help treat treatment-resistant depression. Mm. And to our delight, the results were very good. Now I'm doing this wonderful program at the moment of research, which I'm focused on LSD, because I very much think we should recognize that in many ways, LSD could be called the queen of the psychedelics because it's so pure. And in microdose, taking a fraction of a trip, as I'm sure you know. And it's amazing how it can have the, well, the same effect as the full dose, but in a minute fashion, so that it can boost the mood, the energy, the intellectual capacity. And I'm actually at the moment doing this amazing study with Alzheimer's observation of this 97-year-old lady who had Alzheimer's and had sadly gone into a state of vegetative apathy, didn't even recognize her beloved son. And then after a microdose, she suddenly got back her sense of self and love and said how wonderful she feels. Let's read some poetry. And so, anyway, 
I'm doing research now to investigate talking about breakthroughs and all the studies that you've been doing is like, you know, at, at the moment in the UK, these kind of drugs are regarded as controlled substances, meaning it's illegal to possess or supply them and it can lead to a prison sentence. Mm. Do you think that countries like the UK or America would ever consider legalizing these substances? Well, America, although it created the laws which have criminalized them around the world, is also leading the world in regulating them. Like in Oregon and uh, parts of America, they've decriminalized cannabis use, medical cannabis mm -hmm. use. They've, in some states, legalized it. They are also now legalizing the use of psilocybin. So I very much think that will happen. And I really think that society would benefit if we move rapidly and sensibly, carefully, because by putting them in the hands of criminals, it hasn't stopped use, it's multiplied use. And it's all in the hands of cartels, who obviously go for the weakest link, which is young children. And so it has many, many disadvantages. One is having suppressed research for 60 years, and the other is millions of people having their lives ruined in prisons. All sorts of disasters have happened because of these policies, which were basically a mistake. And we need to reform our policies carefully and surely, but I'm sure it will happen, and I just hope it happens quicker rather than slowly. Amanda, you, you've been at the forefront of psychedelic conversation for six decades now. Yeah. I know there must be lots, but I'd like to end by asking you, what is the one thing that you are the most proud of having accomplished in that time? I suppose opening the door mm. to the move forward. I mean, for me, setting up the Beckley Foundation was a Trojan horse. It was, how do you get into the establishment? I've never been an enemy of the establishment. I want to teach the establishment that actually we can do it better looking after people's health and healthiness, well-being, by using these incredible compounds and techniques to expand our potential cognitive abilities and health. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't see them as enemy. We should think them as a sacred elixir, which we can use to better humanity and help us deal and adapt to the changes which are inevitable with quantum computers and artificial intelligence. There's going to be a whole world of changes which we have to adapt to. And um, what has been shown is that psychedelics at the very base of our being increase neuroplasticity, which is the capacity to adapt. And so we should be hailing these wonderful compounds and the, the governments should be doing a fast-track progress on these compounds. And I'm hoping that will happen in England. And we should be at the forefront of this movement. Amanda, thank you so much for your time today. I, uh, I like to end my episodes by asking my guests for a list. And I was wondering if people are feeling particularly inspired to learn more about psychedelics after our conversation, what are five next steps they can take, whether that's books to find, uh, films to watch or talks to listen to? The Beckley Foundation has a website which people can go. And mm -hmm. I would very much ask people to consider trying to fund it where they can because I to do research is very expensive. But there's other books which have been written. One I enjoyed very much is Entangled Life by Merlin, which is about the fungi. Mm -hmm. And a lovely book called um, The Road to Eleusis, which was written in the 70s about how Eleusis was the center of the classical world where all the great 
philosophers and artists of that age all went and experienced a psychedelic experience at Eleusis called the Eleusinian Mysteries, and that's at the centre of that world. And, oh, of course, there is Aldous Huxley's wonderful book, The Doors of Perception, which is a classic one, Standroff, Realms of Human Consciousness, Observations from LSD Research, The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide by James Fadiman, Mm. Zig Zag Zen, a book about Buddhism and psychedelics. Recently, my old friend Dave Nutt is in the process of bringing out a new book, which I'm sure will be very enlightening. Of course, there's Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, a very good website called Erowid. I mean, I obviously always hope the Beckley Foundation website will be informative, but it could be much better. There's a tiny team at the Beckley. You wouldn't believe how tiny a team we are. But what I want to say is that I'm totally convinced that we are on the right track. These compounds can be very good for humanity, and we need to allow them to have their place. Absolutely. This has been so fascinating. Thank you so much, Amanda, for your time. I really appreciate it. Not at all. My pleasure. My sincere thanks to Amanda Fielding for a truly enlightening conversation. For more from her, visit service95.com for another exclusive list. And be sure to check out Service 95's social media channels for special videos from our chat. I'm also so excited to tell you that this month's Service 95 Book of the Month is Half of a Yellow Sun by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And if you visit service95.com, you'll find a companion piece about the importance of Igbo language and culture in African literature. Keep checking our website and social media channels throughout August for more exclusive content about Half of a Yellow Sun. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to see you all next week. Bye. The Press Girls are back. How are you feeling today? Oh, let me not get into that. <laughs> <laughs> the relationship dilemmas are back. If you've got a bad self, mm-hmm. we're going to see it. And there's going to be consequences. There's going to be consequences. Your voice notes are back. I just wanted to tell you guys how that made me feel. And don't forget, they've got your back. Trust me, guys, when I have a man, <laughs> you lot will be sick and tired. Miriam Musa. Oh, yeah. Adiola Patron. I am that girl. Press. Listen on BBC Sounds.